Hi. I need a nap. <laughs> okay. I love how you're having the same day as me because I was just thinking, could anything more get packed into this day so far? Like there's way too much happening. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, how do you, how do you manage that? But I'm, I'm about to hijack whatever your list is because I have to tell you this thing that happened yesterday. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. So there was a patient brought in by her husband who was, anyway, he's one of our vendors. Okay. We have the watch pad. I finally have enough of a practice that I will be doing sleep studies at the Trotdale Clinic on everybody with hypertension, everybody with a complaint of fatigue, everybody gets a sleep study for probably $200. Wow. A little finger probe costs us 50. And I think the interpretation by an MD who can then write the prescription for the CPAP, because I can't write a prescription for a CPAP, right? So he was our vendor for the watch pad. And he brought in this patient. Um, and she had, when she was in her 20s, she had a colon infection okay. that turned into ulcerative colitis. And it was years and years and years. And then they removed, ultimately removed her whole colon. And she has an ostomy, but, her, but she's had when she first came in, her pain diagram was 40 and 10. So every joint, pain levels of seven. This time, so I treated her once and treated for the infection. Now the infection's gone, but used all the infection. It was strep and then all the virus frequencies. Use that in her abdomen, right? And her pain went from a seven to like a, she left at a four. That was good. Mm -hmm. It lasted for four or five weeks. Yay. So that was January. She came back yesterday. So after two months, she came back in. Her pain was not a seven. It was a five, six. That was good. And I started working on the scar tissue. Did the viruses? Not so much. Scar tissue. And her complaint is low back pain and abdominal pain. So because of everything that happened in her abdomen, the peritonitis and all the surgeries and all that stuff. I did scarring in the ureter and her psoas went wow. And I did scarring in the kidney and the kidney sclerosis and the kidney fat pad and her QLs went wow. And then we did sclerosis in the omentum and that her belly went wow. And then we did scarring in the vagus and everything, because right here, just below her diaphragm, the, I was just tight. Well, there's nothing there to be tight, okay. except where the vagus comes out at the esophagus and the bronchi, all of that just, so scarring in the vagus took that care and then got down to her lower belly. And there's no colon for things to be adhered to, but everything's glued to everything. So we did scarring in the ovary, the tube, the bladder, the uterus on the left and the right. And she, and she said, my pain is always worse when my legs are straight. Okay. Okay, so that means stuff in her belly is stuck. So. Mm -hmm. At the end, we had her straighten her legs. And she said the only thing that hurt was her SI joints, her sacrum. And I went, hmm, tuck, tuck your chin. So she tucked her chin. I said, does that make your tailbone hurt more? She said, well, I feel it up here. And yeah, I'm like, what? So I did scarring in the dura 
And we brought her knees up and we rocked her knees and I rocked her knees to the left and had her turn her head to the right and vice versa. And ultimately her knees were at her chest. And then when she straightened her legs, it was fine. And then she sat up and being a chiropractor, I use an activator. So I got her neck moving, joints moving, reset the proprioceptors, got her thoracic spine moving because now the dura was like not stuck. Lumbar spine, adjusted that, side bend, all that stuff. And then, you know, the toe heel walking that we do? Mm -hmm. Did that. She must have walked 60 feet. So 20, 20, 20. Wasn't, wasn't smoothing out the way it should. So looked at her walk and went, well, duh. So I adjusted her SI joints with the activator, just thump, 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 and then her pubic bone. And once she could move her pelvis, because her pelvis hasn't moved in a really long time, once she could move her pelvis. So then she's getting dressed and she's dressed, she puts her shoes on and she said, there's all these emotions that come up. And so it's like she processed through the, I said, what's your pain level? She said, oh, one, a, a one. And it hasn't been a one in, she's 50. So in 30 years. And it's, it's one. And she said, all these emotions are coming up. And it's like, well, that's the last chapter in the next book is what do you do with the fact that you lost 30 years of your life? Right. What do you do with the fact that they blew you off? They wouldn't prescribe pain meds. They wouldn't believe you. Oh, oh, oh. And then, because, sorry, because of the leaky gut and because of the old infection stuff, there's fluid that accumulates in amongst the scar tissue in her lower left quadrant. So there's a bunch of scar tissue. Interventional radiologists, you're sitting down, right? Okay. I am. Okay. Interventional radiologists put a needle into her abdomen to withdraw that fluid without using Versed or any pain medication. Stop. Hmm? And I said, okay, so let me, let me tell you, oh, that's a good face. And I said, let me tell you how to handle that. This is the reason they do that. Because if they give you Versa, they have to bring in a, a nurse anesthetist. It costs them money, takes them more time. And in a radiology practice, time is money. I've actually seen radiologists, interventional radiologists do SI joint blocks without Versed. That is also a good face. And they rationalize it that they have to know whether it's a pain generator. I've, my guy did SI blocks and facet blocks and out of a sound sleep, the patients jump when you hit a hot joint. Right. So they just make that up because they don't want to spend the time or money on a nurse anesthetist. So I said, so here's the first thing. You have power. You have power. And she's like, that's an interesting concept. I said, you do. You are paying them, not vice versa. And you tell them, you, I won't do this procedure without Versed. And if you won't do Versed, I'll find somebody else to do it. Right. Oh, you absolutely have to have it done. Okay. I'll find you either do it with Versed or I'll do something. So we, we went through the, oh, I get to choose. I have power. We had that conversation. Right. So then at the end, it was, there's all these emotions coming up. And I said, would one of them be anger? And she's a really nice lady. She must have been raised in the South, although she doesn't have an accent, but you know, she's just nice. Yeah. And it's like, uh, yeah, that's like, that's reasonable. 
think about how mistreated you've been. So there, you know, everybody knows the stages of grief. Well, in the last chapter of the next book, it's going to be how do you deal with the emotions when you go from a pain level of a seven that's been there for 30 years and in two 90 minute sessions, it's a one. How, how do you, and then it lasts. How do you deal with that? So there are stages. There's anger and resentment towards the people that abused you. There's no other word for it. Right. And then there's fear that it's going to come back. And then it's like grief that we talk about in the core. There's grief over what you've lost. In 30 years right we haven't been able to do but then i can't, what i told her was what i told you guys i can't i can't make i can't live treating chronic pain patients if i go with them down that rabbit hole so the only thing i can suggest to you i said to her is what did you gain Huh? pain is inconvenient it's limiting it's all of the abuse that you took out of the medical community that's unfortunate but you have more compassion than you did oh yeah more patience yeah um what else did you get well i found out i don't have to do everything yeah, you found out that you are loved and valuable without having to do stuff because there's so much stuff you can't do. Now you get to keep the wisdom and get rid of the pain. What you, I mean, I didn't, aside from the frequencies for the infections, that's the only thing out of the advanced I used. Mm -hmm. Everything else is now done in the core. And the joint mobilization, I guess you have to be a chiropractor, or own an activator. I taught a physical therapist to use an activator. And it's like the joint mobilization, you would have done a different way. An osteopath would have done a different way. Mm -hmm. But the emotional part is, it's a feature of what we deal with. There is no other medical intervention ever that is pain-free. She had no, no discomfort whatsoever in this procedure. Um, it's pain-free. And it took her from a seven to a one in basically two and a half hours after 30 years. Right. There's, there's no other thing that you can do that, that it, it's an identity crisis that is unparalleled in medicine. I say that in the core, but that happened in my office yesterday. Wow. So how... <laughs> you're welcome. And I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> right. It's, and we say that we say that to our patients too, right? Because like you said, you can't, you know, we do so much as far as like, you know, drink water, stay hydrated, keep moving after your appointment. I give them a laundry list, but you don't tell them how to feel and you don't tell them what to expect emotionally because, well, everybody's different, but you can almost, especially if you've got some mileage in this game, I could peg who is going to have an emotional event after a treatment and yes, it's the chronic pain patients. It's the ones that have seen absolutely everybody before they've seen you. It's the, um, it's, yeah, it's those people. And how, how do you prepare them? How do you prepare yourself? Well, what I told her was if just notice them and you're allowed, the feelings that you have are real. So number one, you give them permission number right. two is yeah this is really normal right. this is normal so feel what you feel and if you get stuck 
on one or the other. If you get stuck in anger, you get stuck in fear, or you get stuck in grief. If you get stuck, we have frequencies for those. And the next time you come in, which will be in about two months, you're, you'll work through the emotions. And how you do that is, like you said, everybody's different. And if you get stuck, we have frequencies for that. And I didn't run them just because we were out of time. It's like I had to, I had to get going. Right. But, and I said, she, she's got a supportive spouse. Um, and I said, you'll, you'll work your way through them. And this is, this is usually the progression, but I try and reframe it for them at the end of that, that visit. Yeah, really, this was awful and you were maltreated and I don't blame you, right? Whatever you feel is whatever you feel and it's just fine. And look at what you gained. I have to, I, it's the only way I can keep my sanity. There are times when the only way you learn something is by something that would be considered inconvenient. So virtually every person who survives cancer says it was awful and I learned so much. You got COVID, the brain fog was horrible, but it made you a better person, a better practitioner. Yes, yeah. But yet it got compassion. Oh, that's a real thing. I mean, my medical history would make anybody's hair stand on end. Right. And you, you learn things that you could not learn any other way, I swear. I, I personally am ready to get, you know, text messages, um, emails, you know, psychic events, whatever it takes. I'm kind of, knock on wood, kind of done with the medical events. But yeah, it's... <sighs> Yeah. And I, you know, going back to the advanced, I, I, I keep thinking about it every day. I've been thinking about a day at the advanced or a conversation at the advanced. And I think so many of us were so hungry for that human interaction because of COVID, because of everybody's been in their little isolated bubbles for so long. And the collaboration that goes on at the advance between all these practitioners from all these different backgrounds, yet we all share that same common denominator of doing what we do and yes the compassion that we go through you know intrinsically ourselves through our own experiences but then living vicariously through other practitioners stories to me is what these meetings are all about you know uh, you telling your, your patient stories you know um, a patient listening will identify with your story a practitioner who treats a patient like what you just say will identify and get some inspiration. And yeah, this isn't just about frequency, right? It's just about a, a human to human connection. I, I, and there were, we were so hungry for each other, for that camaraderie and companionship. But that leads me to a story for something that happened today. Okay. I had a, um, message on my cell phone from a patient in Austin, Texas. <clears throat> and she tracked me down. I said, how did you hear about me? And she said, oh, and named a practitioner that was at the advanced or just taken the core of the advanced. And this woman's husband had his leg amputated at the hip when he was 15 for bone cancer, that's a good face. And he's had, and he's 50 something, 60 something. And he's had phantom limb pain since he was 16. So it usually takes about a year. And he said that there's nothing that works for it. So he doesn't take anything for it. And he said, it's worse at night. And it's like, yeah, it always is. And I said, so, far we haven't had any failures now i don't expect 
anything to be a hundred percent, but, and I'm only into low double digits, like 10 ish. So I don't know if it's going to work for you, but it can't hurt you. Right. And it's, it's, it's simple and it's okay. If you don't believe me, that would be, but it's, so I asked her, she hasn't read the book. She had a friend tell her about FSM and us. And then she's been listening to the podcast. And someplace in the podcast, I must have said something like, well, fan and limb pain is like easy. It is just, it's just, uh, there's not even any physical medicine to do until you get to the scarred down area at the stump. And he's got some L3 stuff because he said putting a vibrator, a massager on his low back helps. And it's like, well, what that does is provide proprioceptive input at L3, which is at the hip, and L2 to block ascending pain messages. And it's, he said, but I can't sleep on my back and I can't use a massager in the middle of the night when it's horrible. And it's like, well, let's find you a practitioner in Austin. And then I find out that our website, the back end, our search possibilities are busted for some reason. Some plug in, someplace quit. And so, but we'll find her a practitioner because this just isn't that hard. Right. In what world can you say that phantom limb pain is just not that hard? I know. I yeah interesting yeah it's like it's gotta love them. that that being said i arranged for um a close friend to get a pacemaker there's a place and that the cardiologist said well maybe we could handle it with drugs and this particular drug is really good at that thing um, but we have to check his liver and it's like, no, you don't. Cause he's not going to tolerate it. He was exposed to carbon tetrachloride. He can't drink alcohol, can't drink coffee. He said, okay, then no drugs. Got it. So we'll do the pacemaker. And it, so there's, there's a place for everybody side by side. Right. Oh, I love that sentence. Oh, I love that. Yeah. There's Very good. Yes, there is a place. You know, I was, um, I had a whole bunch of new patients um, last week and already this week, and they take up so much bandwidth in my brain. And I, I tried to put new patients, I used to sprinkle them throughout the week, and then I got overloaded. And then I felt like the patient that I saw after the new patient wasn't getting all of me because my brain was attached to them as they left the clinic still. <laughs> Yes. Got and it. then, and then I would see all the new patients in one day. And then that was way too much overload. I'm like, okay, hey, I can't do that ever again. Mm -mm. So, um, I have an interesting story. So I have a new patient, lots of trauma, lots of practitioners, lots of back pain, athletic, kind of a, a, a big mix personality wise, very stoic. He's an athlete, um, but struggled with pain. And he's had pain for so long. And I can't remember how he was referred to me. Um, but when he came back for his second appointment, he's like, I have to tell you a story. And I said, okay. And he said, I was doing a zoom call with somebody and I went to rotate to get something. And I winced and the person's like, Oh, are you okay? And he's like, I don't know why I winced. I didn't have pain. What's up with that? And I'm like, well, that's because all your brain is, has ever known for years and years and years is rotation with flexion causes pain. And he's like, but I didn't have pain. Why did I do that? I'm like, well, we've got some work to do. 1489. It's like, I know why. I know why. Pick me, pick me. Totally. Pick yeah. And, you know, we, we talk about that a lot. You know, when you have that patient that sits up after a big treatment. 
and you know, you've done a lot as a practitioner, but when they have that really kind of, it's not that stone. Yeah. It's like a confusion and you can almost see the synapses in slow motion scanning to try to find the pain. And when it's not there, it's too much sometimes for 40 and 89. It's 40 and 89. So 40 and 89 is what we use um, for um, um, quiet. quiet or scared to move it or um, hesitation, trying to find the pain. So quieting or reducing the activity, right? Of the midbrain. Yeah. And, and midbrain, for those non-practitioners, there's, we have one frequency that encompasses the amygdala, which is the emotional response and the hippocampus, which is memory simplified, but memory, especially of physical activities that are linked to emotional responses. So the amygdala and hippocampus are the reason that when you are two years old and you touch the hot stove or you touch the fireplace or you touch the wood stove and your mom says hot and you touch it anyway and it burns your fingers, the amygdala goes ow, emotion, pain, and the hippocampus says, I need to remember that. And then the thalamus, process, it's, a, it's a junction station. It processes pain signals. So you take those three, and we have a frequency for them, 89. It's all the midbrain. And that one I trust more than the individual frequencies that have been scanned for. And so you turn down the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the thalamus the emotions, the memory of pain and dysfunction, and the thalamus, are we going to suppress pain or amplify pain once you've had pain for more than about six months, unless you're a fireman, a policeman, a contractor, or a football player, they use their thalamus to suppress pain, but other people, it amplifies pain. And Every signal, like you go to move, your sensory and motor cortex says, I want to rotate to the left. And that I want to rotate to the left initiates movement. But before it can get to the cerebellum, the part of the brain that coordinates movement, it has to go through the junction box that says, is this going to hurt? Do I remember that it hurt? And is the thalamus suppressing or amplifying pain? Everything goes through that decision-making tree. And so you, you go to move and he winced because the midbrain didn't know it wasn't gonna hurt because the memory of the pain is right there in the hippocampus. That's what it gets paid to do. Right. And it went through there and he winced because that's connected. It, once, you, if, once you see the connections, you can't ever unsee them, especially when you can manipulate them. I know. <laughs> so another story, um, some of you guys might know, my daughter tore her ACL. And it was a, it's a complete rupture. We have a phenomenal surgeon lined up and we did our, um, our consult with them and she's locked into, she can't fully extend. She hovers in about 20 degrees of flexion. She doesn't want to extend it. Now there's not that much inflammation left anymore. Thank you to FSM for that. And the surgeon says, okay, extend your leg. And she's like, no, I can't. And he's like, oh, no, you can. The ACL is torn, but there's there's nothing limiting you from extending. You can do it. And he said it with such confidence and such um, certainty. And I saw it on her face that, you know, she kept looking at him, looking at me, looking at her knee, surgeon, mom, knee, and she did it. And he's like, okay, so you have something to work for now. You have to keep do flexion extension. You have to do all these things. And 
it doesn't cause pain. It may feel funny because it's unstable, but there's no pain there. But again, going back to day one of the injury, it caused pain. And like you said, that midbrain gets paid to remember the pain generating movement. So what we can do with FSM and um, movement patterning is that's what sets my hair on fire every morning because yeah. you can interrupt that cycle so fast. And the thing that he missed because he, so the, the thing that he missed because he isn't us is the cerebellum. The cerebellum knows that the ACL is torn. Yeah. It knows that the knee is unstable. Now, what he did, you know I'm a neuro geek, right? Yes. Because I have these pictures of the brain in my head. And the sensory and motor cortex says, I want to extend my, uh, fully extend my leg. That means I have to contract my quads. And that message goes to the thalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. And then it goes to the cerebellum. Now, there is a side pathway through the frontal lobe, anterior cingulate cortex and the prefrontal cortex. And the surgeon talked to the cortex and made a strong enough statement that the cortex was able to tell the amygdala and the hippocampus and the thalamus, yeah, it doesn't hurt. And the thalamus said, yeah, it really doesn't hurt. And the cerebellum is sitting there having conniption fits <laughs> because are you crazy? This joint is unstable. Her leg is going to, I'm not going to move it. And the prefrontal cortex and the frontal cortex say, yeah, you are. It's going to be fine. And the cerebellum is, I mean, if you had watched, if you were watching her quadriceps, they were almost fasciculating yes they were tentative they were are you yes. kidding me yes the motor units were all over the map yeah so they were not in coordination because the cerebellum like so didn't want to do it but the sensory and motor cortex said straighten your leg the prefrontal cortex is now yelling at the midbrain to say you just hush up there we're fine and the cerebellum is going what huh are you sure okay okay I guess if the okay well and the other step in all of that is to create knee extension yes you need the quadriceps to contract but you also need the hamstrings to elongate to and there is no way so once the quad started contracting the hamstrings were still like no mm -mm. <laughs> no <laughs> sorry you know and you see this like this war going on between, you know, it, it's just, just fascinating. It's a, it's a conversation. Yeah. And it's, it would have been an easier conversation. I'm hoping her leg was supported on the table. It was. Yeah. If it's fully supported on the table and there's no risk of dislocating the joint, it's like, uh, okay. And you finally, you watched like the quadriceps kept contracting and the hamstrings are having a fit and the cerebellum is having an anxiety attack and the prefrontal <laughs> cortex says no you're going to do this and you see this whole it helps if you anthropomorphize it into like a a quartet or a a, a group therapy session or something totally it, it's like so I use this term at the advance because I talk about um, the abdominals the lumbar spine and the glutes they're always having a power struggle and I've named it a, a polyamorous codependent relationship. Between the abdominals and the, the, the lumbar spine and the glutes. Well, and yeah, the abdom well, the abs, the psoas has to be in there too. It is, but it's sort of like a rogue player because it's never the psoas. Sorry. Well, yeah, but if the but if the brain has decided that it needs to protect the ureter. The psoas yes. ain't going anywhere. Correct. And the glutes and the QLs and lumbar paraspinals and the rectus abdominis can do whatever it wants. And as long as the cerebellum or the whatever, the cerebellum, there we go, um, wants to protect the ureter, 
everybody can be as codependent and narcissistic as they want. And so as is sitting there going, nope, I know. I'm going to do it. You're, you're very right about that. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. it's just, yeah, yeah. So throughout the surgical consult, I was just like, where is my precision care? Cause I could override all of this <laughs> and she could do it. 81 and 84 and 40 and 89 and she'll be fine. Exactly. And would look at you like you would, excuse me. I know they, they will, they will learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm probably the worst mama bear um, FSM oh. practitioner there is. So I wouldn't want to be the, mm -mm, no, nope. We have a lot of questions to get I'm, at. So we've yeah. told some story. Let's get to some of the questions that are on here um, quickly. And then, um, cause there's one I want to talk about really fast. Um, where did it potential skeptical client that's worried about frequencies reversing things or reversing things wrong like cancer or messing with brain in a negative way how would you explain this so we get i probably get this once a month not very often people are kind of are coming like can you treat my tonsils <laughs> like, no <laughs> Um, but yeah, sometimes you do get patients that think something bad will happen because of the frequencies. So go. And the, the answer, Denise is, yeah, we're taught how not to do that in our training. I didn't just pick this up at, you know, Walgreens and start using it on you. I, I didn't just buy it on the internet. It, this particular company, you have to be trained in order to use this. So we have one paper that shows pretty conclusively that if the patient has active tumor you don't know about using frequency um, modulated microamperage current is not gonna make it worse. That's Arlene Lennox's paper that's in our published papers. If you haven't read Arlene Lennox's paper, read it. It's brilliant. She used an AccuScope and it does a sweep of frequencies on one channel, but it's frequency modulated microamperage current. And she was treating scar tissue in the neck and patients who'd been radiated for previous cancer. And she had a small cohort of patients who had active tumor receiving radiation therapy currently for the active tumor at the same time that she was treating them for the scar tissue from a previous episode. So we have that paper. That's so we're not going to make that bad. And doing messing with the brain in the negative way, we're taught not to do that. We don't run 81 and 89. And in a patient with certain kinds of autonomic disorders, we don't run 81 and 94. Why don't you do that? Well, because 81 and 89 made somebody in a coma cry, right? And I swear to God, I've had practitioners in seminars say out loud, well, why is that a bad thing? Excuse me? That's a good face. I love it when your face is like what's going on inside. <laughs> my so it's like, it, it's not okay to it what it demonstrated was that we have more or less absolute control over the functions of certain parts of the brain when you can take somebody with a stroke and make them from spastic to full range and it lasts for a week by running 81 in the sensory and motor cortex so it's like yay um so how would you explain this it's we're trained not to do that. And this technique has been around for 25, 26, 27 years now, 24, no, 24 years, 20, let's say 25, round it up, it sounds better. So it's been around for 25 years, there's two books, there's 13 published papers and there's 4,000 practitioners in 23 countries. So the training is pretty rigorous and I've been taught not to do that. And if you're not comfortable, we can do something else. Right. Or you can go to this website and I can show you the published papers and 
I can show you the slides where I'm taught not to mess with the brain. That's that's a thing. Right. Okay, do the CRPS one. Why, Denise, you're having a week. <laughs> How come I can't see the CRPS question? Hang on. Also, you can read it. You read it. patient day two that has not had an injury that she can think of that would cause it started last spring with the right foot feeling deep burning and like deep ice to her not to touch. Now on both feet had a miscarriage 18 months ago. Uh, it's not CRPS because the, it's not CRPS. I mean, it sounds like she's been diagnosed with CRPS. Yes, she writes CRPS in quotes. So I wonder if that was like a self-diagnosis from a patient her, maybe. Her feels cold, deep burning in and I deep burning and like deep ice to her, but not to touch. So when it's CRPS, it actually feels cold because the sympathetics are disconnected from the peripheral tissue. So unless there's a temperature difference or a color difference, it's not CRPS. So there's that. Then deep burning, try 40 and 10. She tried- I did 43 and 96. Doctors have diagnosed it. Yeah, doctors are wrong, Denise. <laughs> you're you're right. It's not cold to touch. Mm. They call it CRPS because they want to die. Once you have CRPS, it's incurable. So then they don't have to try. So that's it's kind of like when they diagnose you with fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. well, anything that ends in syndrome, right? That's just that garbage can diagnosis of everybody just jumps in the same bucket of yeah. that. Yeah, it's like, yeah. So um, 40 to 396, 40 and 10. How long did you run 40 and 10? Oh, 30 minutes each on different custom cares. Well, you did the right things. You did what I would choose. The only, what's interesting is how, how long after the miscarriage did she, Hmm. <clears throat> 40 and 92 or 81 and 92 or right. 40 and 89. So there's a homunculus in the spinal cord, the thalamus and the sensory and motor cortex. And if 40 and 10 didn't work, then it's higher up. <clears throat> So you could do 40 and 89, maybe, in both feet. So it started in one foot, went to both feet. That puts it up in the sensory motor cortex or the thalamus, maybe. What about? Small fiber neuropathy. 40, 40 and 10 and 81 and 10, two machines at the same time. That would depend on... That would depend on whether or not her quads and pectineus is tight. That has been an amazing pairing for so many of my patients. I have to say it's, I don't know how it works. Watching, watching the look on Jay Shaw's face when we ran 81 and 10 on David Murphy. So Jay did the reflexes, felt the tone in the muscles. And because it was the second night in a row, we'd done 81 and 10 on Murphy and we'd figured out that 40 and 10 made him worse. So we didn't do 40 and 10 to quiet the activity in the cord. We just did straight up 81 and 10 increase descending inhibition in the cord. And to watch the look on Jay Shaw's face when the tone in his legs changed and his reflexes became normal in 20 minutes was worth the price of admission. That was like the coolest thing of the whole day. We yeah, get, yeah, know. yeah. And Jay Shaw's brain is hurting. It's like maybe, yeah, I have no idea why that worked. Yeah. What are you doing? It's like, yeah, good question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, 
Okay, are we done with that one? There's some other questions I wanna make sure we get to. Yep. Um, is there any reason to not use concussion in Vegas on a 10 year old autistic child who is semi-verbal? Watching Steve the dad and his interview about concussion and his grown son, the benefits of FSM for autism, this has given some hope to a family friend. Could we have, um, have this run on him at night or should we just stick with concussion? Or could concussion in Vegas work for home nightly? Is there any reason not to? Well, so here comes the part where we have to say, it's not like we know what we're doing. So um, I would try it and see how he, um, and see how he responds. The, the vagus tends to quiet down the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the thalamus. So the, the vagus has a straight shot up and directly influences. So the midbrain has the ability to turn off the vagus or turn it down, never goes completely off. So it has the ability to turn it down but it depends on ascending information from the vagus about the body. Right. So when we treat the vagus to increase secretions or vitality in the vagus, we have the ability to increase ascending messages to the stress centers in the brain, increase the messages that say, dude, we're fine down here. It's, it's really okay. And that if the midbrain quiets down, then the stress messages that go to the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingular cortex, which are involved in autism as far as I know. So if the midbrain, and the midbrain has direct wiring that goes to those two parts of the brain. If you can increase the activity of the vagus, it'll help keep the midbrain quiet and that'll help the anterior cingulate and the prefrontal cortex, that will help them to be healthier and happier. And it's like, might help, can't hurt. And if it is bad, autistic kids have good days and bad days anyway. So it's not gonna make him permanently worse. That's the other nice thing with FSM. It's not like we change signaling in cells. We change signaling in the nervous system. And um, you just erased Alf's question. Um, <laughs> I didn't. No, I didn't get to that one as far as I know. So, um, so the... There. We'll put it back. It's on the answered. Okay. So when we create a change, we're changing cell signaling, but if there's nothing there to support it, like if there really is an infection, midbrain can turn the vagus off faster than you turn it on. So you make somebody temporarily worse, they're, they're, it's, it's going to revert back because there's no stable state to support it. Yeah. So I'd try it. So far, turning the Vegas on has never made anybody worse. I don't can, think. can we just pause for a sec? Because Facebook's um, uh, message, sometimes people are going crazy about the Vegas and 40. For some reason, those two keep circulating. People are afraid to run 40 and people are afraid to turn the Vegas on. And I'm not sure why that is. I mean, we have precautions for sure. We have precautions in the course, but I think we do a good job of explaining that it's, it's good news. Right. Yeah. I don't get it. Okay. You don't. It's like somebody that by the time you're my age, it really is the end of codependence as we know it. I, <laughs> I am not responsible for somebody else's neuroses. Right. Okay. So 40, if somebody has an occult, which means hidden infection, yes, hidden, 
you think it's just inflammation, but it is an infection that is masquerading as inflammation. Yes. You turn down the inflammation, it's quiet for three to four hours, and when it comes back on, it's worse. Then you know it's an infection. Yeah. That's good news. Yeah. That makes you afraid to use 40. I don't mean to be insulting, but you need to go back over your notes and get a grip on your personal liability or anxiety. It's like, what, what? Yeah. How that is good news. Do you not understand? For sure. I just. No, any, any time I've made anybody and I'm going to put air quotes worse and it's not even worse. Maybe their pain went up the next day. It's been because of 40, but they were so happy that we found something in their jaw that could be treated that I got a bouquet of roses the next day. And with ligature laxity in the shoulder, once again, kind of diagnostic, um, got some imaging done and figured out there was partial thickness tear and, or a disc issue, right? And that was the other time. Yeah. We get, we get the muscles all relaxed. The patient comes in and said, and we even, there's a whole slide on it. Yeah. Patient comes in and said, that treatment made me so much worse. Yeah. And it's like, well, let's see. When you left here, you were a two. Exactly when did your pain go up? Oh, oh yeah, I was better, wasn't I? Uh-huh. Right. When did it go up? I don't know, six hours later. And what did you do in the four hours that it was down? Oh, I felt so good. I did this and this and this and this. And it's, and then you, so that's why you have them fill out a pain diagram in a 10 centimeter line every single visit. Yeah. Pre and and post pre pain, pre-treatment, pain, post-treatment. You need that. Visual analog scale. So you, you know, oh, look, you were a one when you left. Oh yeah, that's right. And now draw your pain diagram today. And so this, and so the first pain diagram is at the base of the skull and the shoulders and in between the shoulder blades and down the arms. And now this time it's a circle right there. And that's, you see the two diagrams? Oh, oh yeah. Okay, that's good news. We're gonna get flexion and section films. And then you run 124 and 100 and 124 and 77. And that's all you do. And maybe you treat the disc. And then you go order flexion as tension films. Uh, right. It's good news. It's good news. There's no thing bad. No. So I, I, I just wanted to throw it out there. Okay. And the same, want- the same thing with the Vegas. The, if people are afraid to treat the vagus, they just need to go back and watch the webinar again because yeah. you're afraid to treat the vagus because it's really pretty magical stuff. But uh, most of the time, fear is based on you just don't know enough to do it. Yeah. You have to remember that I was terrified to treat the vagus from 2000 until Diana Cross in 2015 or 17. Right. And when I found out that Diana Cross said, the vagus controls the immune system and inflammation, it's like, oh, okay, fine. I need to go home and figure this out. So I sat on the couch, I put a pulse oximeter on myself. My resting pulse was 63 or 64. I ran increased secretions in the vagus and my resting pulse was 63. Okay, okay then. So put a pulse oximeter on them. Now the only scary one I've had recently was a lady, according to the pulse ox, her pulse went down to 34. And I said, when I saw on the pulse ox that it was 34, I said, how do you feel? I, I feel fine. You, you feel fine? Yeah, I feel fine. That's like, and I didn't say, well, your pulse ox said you should be unconscious. <laughs> but okay, she felt fine. I don't get it, but didn't make me stop treat. I actually switched from 81 to 49 just in case. But yeah. 
Okay, one more question. Okay. This is Elf's. Um, so a friend of his had pain in the descending colon area, which was a seven to eight out of 10, tried oh. the Vegas protocol with custom care along with spasm and the descending with the precision care. This reduced the pain slightly, then increased it back up to the original level. Yep. I stopped these frequencies, then switched to general inflammation protocol along with pain reaction with the precision care. Ran this for a few hours until 4 a.m. Pain reduced enough that he could go home and slept for a bit. The next day, pain increased again. Um, he had a Well, just end of discussion. Alf, dude, diverticulitis is infected. So descending colon, two things you have to rule out. So when you look at David Musnick's um, visceral day, he's got red flag stuff. So I don't know, I don't remember what Alf's degree is, clinical train licenses, but you palpate where his colon is. And if it's super tender in the descending colon, diverticulitis, the diverticuli are usually the bottom half, but they can be any place along the descending and in the sigmoid. And when they get infected, they're little pouches and you get a seed in it, or you get a for me, it was always, it was um, summer sweet corn, summer corn, and you get a little piece of food in that little pouch, that little pocket, diverticuli, and it gets infected, and it hurts a lot, and so that's why nothing worked. Number one, you didn't know that it was diverticuli, unless you're an MD or you've ever had diverticulitis. Um, there's no reason you should know it, so don't beat yourself up. There's no reason you should have known it. What you did wasn't unreasonable, but when 40 didn't work and it was worse, the first thing that comes to your head is infection. And the reason the vagus didn't work is it is the job of the vagus to notify the brain that there is infection, stress, and trauma or trauma, infection, stress, and trauma. When it's infection, which is what diverticulitis is, diverticulosis, so you have diverticulitis, which is, it's just inflamed diverticulosis, it's infected, or vice versa, I, whatever it is, you have this thing, and it's an infection. So when it flares up, number one, hurts like crazy. Number two, the appropriate intervention is Augmentin, assuming you're not allergic to penicillin, and metronidazole, because the bacteria that are in that little pouch can be both aerobic and anaerobic. So it's, and the reason I know all this is that back in 2016, when I was headed to Colorado to write the book, I had basically nine days to write the book. The night before we were supposed to leave, I got this left lower quadrant pain that was so intense. I just looked at George and I said, I've got diverticulitis. And so the next morning I called the imaging center and said, I need um, a CT with contrast. Because I looked up, how do you diagnose diverticulitis? And it said CT with contrast. So I knew what to run order on myself. And I got the CT with contrast and the radiologist came and met me and said, yep, see that? You've got diverticulitis. It's like, yeah, how do you treat it? And he said, oh, antibiotics. So I call, my, we de delayed the flight to the next day. So I called my naturopath and said, Werner, I need Augmentin and metronidazole. I've got diverticulitis. He said, right, where do you want me to call it in? We picked it up at six o'clock and we caught the flight at 11 o'clock the next day. And that's how come I know about diverticulitis. Right. So as we were talking about before, it's inconvenient, but now I know more about diverticulitis than I ever wanted to know. Right. Or ever would have known. See, so and that's when it goes back to that, um, what, what do we learn, right? 
Really quickly, um, somebody asked, which webinar has the Vegas training? I did my cores in 12 and 13. Well, you need to come back for more core training because it's a completely different world. Um, but the Vegas webinar is on the FrequencySpecific.com website. If you go down halfway, you'll see resources and webinars, and it's right there, and you have to watch it. Yeah, it's the one I've Especially if you've done the core in 2012. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, the, the core in 2022, even 2020, was is a whole different, and the advance this year, whole different if you took the first, what, 102 slides and a laminate, you could figure out just about anything. Mm -hmm. the webinars from 2019, it's like COVID was really inconvenient, but it gave me a lot of time to think and I have a low boredom threshold. So we did mold, Ehlers-Danlos, stroke. I turned the Vegas from a, um, advanced 90 minute workshop into a 60 minute webinar and it actually improved it because I had to tighten it up and make it clearer. Um, mold, Ehler, the Ehlers Danlos is one of my favorites. Mine too. Who knew? Who knew? And Who knew? Like I almost want to, you know, send people out. How's your thumb? You want to come and get treated? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty fun. And the results are almost instant. I, I had a woman that, thank goodness for that webinar, because I had such direction, whereas before I'd probably be all over the map with what I'd probably get to everything eventually, but it's nice when you have a plan, plan of attack. And she popped off, off the table and she said, I feel so strong and solid. And I was like, yes, because she didn't have a ton of pain coming in. It wasn't It was like a four or five. So you're, those patients, you're not maybe looking for the pain to go down, but when you can get a result, like, I feel strong. I feel like I can stand in my hip again. I feel like blah, 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 blah. Like somebody, the bait and score, there's nine. So thumb, little finger past 90 degrees, elbow past zero, knees past zero, touch both hands on the floor, bait and score, there's nine things. When you can take someone from a baton nine out of nine to the knees of the hardest, I haven't figured out knees yet, but from a nine out of nine to a two out of nine, the, in an hour, like 60 minutes, and then they have body pain that everybody thinks is because their joints are lax. So there, someone said, how can, how can they avoid these joint surgeries where they tighten the ligaments? It's like, oh, because it doesn't ever fix the pain because the pain isn't coming from that. It's coming from the discs in their neck. And this, I was talking to a practitioner that hasn't taken a course since 2008. And oh, that's a good face. And, um, she said, well, they have so much joint pain. I was like, no, look at the diagram. They're 40 and 10. Oh, how are they 40 and 10? Well, the disc annulus is made of connective tissue. Oh, and it's like you do 124 and 77, 40 and 10, and then vagal tone, because they have traction injuries in their vagus every time they stand up. They get up, the POTS is gone, the body pain's gone, and they've gone from a bait and nine to a bait and two. It's okay. like, and it happens in 60 minutes. And the difficulty with that is you have to run 40 and 89 at the end of it. And that's been the biggest challenge I have are the ones that are so used to being hypermobile that when you get them normal. Tightened up, yeah, it's, I don't even say tightened up, but just solid, yeah, it's. Yeah. Um, then you have it, to do 81 and 84 and send them to are you still in Livermore? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Send them to Livermore. Oh. And they can learn how to move all over again. Yeah, exactly. Before we leave, I have to show you what I was gifted today or the other day. Oh. 
everybody knows you might be a neuro geek, but I am a anatomy geek. So for those of you who are listening, this is an unbelievable book. I make everybody wash their hands before they touch it. It's human anatomy, a visual history from the Renaissance to the digital age. And it has the most amazing diagrams from starting in 1525 of just old that's, anatomy. That's Michelangelo. Yeah. Well, no, this one is... Julio Cesar Cesare, wow. but but my um, was the first one wasn't he the first one that dug up bodies? I thought so. I don't know. But um, when patients bring me rare old books, oh my god, that's so cool! They move up to the top of the list. So thank yes. you, patient, who brought this to me because um, back like no 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 that. The diagrams in the oh wow right Nervous isn't, that, isn't that crazy well and so, then john sharkey in the plastination world yes like look Body. i know it's the podcast so the listeners can't read this but i urge you to look at human anatomy a visual history from the renaissance to the digital age it's beautiful Oh, that's so cool. Makes my heart happy. And that's why I love netters. And I know there's a lot of great software out there um, for patient education, but there's nothing like picking up my netters first and second edition and just looking through these beautiful drawings. Well, and Candace Elliott is an expert in using the essential anatomy. Sen app. Yeah, which is great. Yes. And she knows how to maneuver it. And every time I try, I, he stands on his head and I... <laughs> <laughs> there's like oh script let me just open that or i know where to find it i know exactly well that's it for today really it is it's true i gotta run back to the clinic too so oh we have a patient tonight you're brave yeah try to you know it's just what this week had to squish it all in so you got it thanks everybody keep the questions coming we'll keep carrying on all the great things for next week and um yeah. See you we'll next week. Bye. Yeah. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.